The following is a recording of a live questions and answers session with Chris McCann that took place on Friday, December 6th, 2019. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to eBible Fellowship's uh, Friday night question and answer program. Tonight, we're going to take a look at the at the Bible with an, any of your questions and if anyone does have a question, you can dial the number that was just mentioned, and I'll try to respond to your question by going to the Bible, which is God's holy word. Why don't we get started by going to the first person on the phone tonight. Welcome to our question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Hi, Chris. Could you please read uh, Matthew 24? Verses um, 6 and 7. Matthew 24, starting in verse 6. It says, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet, for nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. I was wondering if you could maybe give a quick summary to explain wars and rumors of wars and who the nation against nation and the kingdom against kingdom are. Well, yeah. Um, historically, we know this is the typical way the world has operated, that throughout the history of time, there have been wars and rumors of wars, and nation has risen against nation. So we can understand it on that level, but there's also the spiritual warfare that has raged throughout the history of the world between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. I think that's what it would be pointing to, that the Lord Jesus went forth on a white horse, conquering to conquer. Satan rode after him to take peace away from the earth. Or the seed was sown upon the hearts of men, and then the fowls come immediately to snatch away that which was sown. So it was a spiritual battle. Now, I don't think that, that this is focused on Judgment Day in, in the sense that we see a lot of trouble in the world and we're hearing a lot of reports from this nation and that nation and there are some physical battles still going on. But most of what we see, most of the things we see in the world are um, more divisions within nations. Uh, yes, many nations have had civil wars and division within at some point in the past, but normally warfare has been one nation against another nation. Uh, we, we can look back at World War I, World War II, and nations side, they get their allies and fight other nations who have their allies, and, and at least there's unity to some degree, with those nations that are uh, in the alliance. But that's not what we're seeing now. We're, we're seeing springing up in nation after nation after nation, dissent, uh, division, and in some cases it, it looks pretty serious, almost to the point of civil war. And I think that has not been the case in time past. You know, there is a interesting verse in Jeremiah 25, in Jeremiah 25, that we had interpreted prior to May 21 as taking place in Judgment Day, and we thought it would fit in with the great earthquake, that it would be a rolling earthquake from nation to nation. But actually, it is more what we're seeing right now. It says in Jeremiah 25, and, and, and the context is judgment on the world, when the world has to drink of the cup of the wrath of God, 
after the church has already drank from that cup. And it says in verse 31, A noise shall come even to the ends of the earth, for Jehovah hath a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh. He will give them that are wicked to the sword, saith Jehovah. Thus saith Jehovah of hosts, Behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation, and a great whirlwind shall be raised up from the coast of the earth, and the slain of Jehovah shall be at that day from one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered nor buried. They shall be dung upon the ground. And we're seeing this fulfilled in a spiritual way when we're, we're seeing one nation after another have turmoil and just constant division within it. And it does not seem to get better. You know, we're in time past, yes, there'd be turmoil, but politicians would see their errors and smooth over to differences and the people will come back together again. But it's rare if it's happening at all, we're, we're just not seeing that. The split just gets greater and greater. And thank you for calling. And now we're going to go to our next caller tonight. Welcome to our Friday night program. Please go ahead with your call. Isaiah 57, verse 1. I have a question. Isaiah 57, 1 says, The righteous perisheth, and no man layeth it to heart, and merciful men are taken away, none considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. Yes. Now, I'm not going to ask you again about the persecutions or the judgment or the wrath, but I want to ask you, at what point does the rapture occur? Is this verse help any? Or, I mean, because we go through the judgment, right? That's what you had been saying, right? Right. right. Now, maybe this will help. Okay. Uh, Mr. Camping taught that there would be the Great Tribulation, 23 years, 8,400 days. May 21, 2011 was the end of the Great Tribulation, the beginning of Judgment Day, and he understood Judgment Day to be five literal months, but the whole five months was viewed by God as a single day. So it was a prolonged judgment. And Yet, because I think of maybe some leftover information from the church age or the traditional point of view, or, or just having the idea that the elect cannot go through the judgment because we've been judged already in Christ at the foundation of the world without yet having the understanding of Christ's demonstration seep in to that doctrine. That is, really the answer was with what we learn concerning Christ's demonstration that he did make payment at the foundation of the world. He died. He made the atonement. But he came into the world nonetheless to demonstrate it. And, and, and so the solution, one of the solutions to the mystery of God's judgment program was to understand it's the same thing for the elect who were in Christ at the foundation of the world and therefore had their sins paid for, but God will have them demonstrate that fact by going through the judgment. Just as Jesus demonstrated his atoning work or the judgment upon him, the elect must, in a similar way, demonstrate the fact that they have no sin upon them, and the way that God is determined to do that is by having them successfully go through the whole prolonged judgment period without harm, without destruction at the end of it. They abide. They endure to the end only because there is no sin upon them, because Christ has paid for their sins, and, and so they, I think we can say, are also 
um, showing forth to principalities and powers that God has truly washed away all their sin and cleansed them, and they are without spot or wrinkle, and the proof of it is their endurance as they stand before the judgment seat of Christ. But that information was not understood or known by Mr. Camping. So he had the idea that the elect have already paid for the judgment, and if you ever listen to any of the old open forums, he always will point that out, that no, no, we don't go through the judgment. No, all those that will be standing before the judgment throne are the unsaved, the wicked. They're the ones we, we cannot because our sins were paid for. But again, now we understand how it is possible and it is God's plan that we do go through the judgment. Therefore, the change, the correction, is instead of the elect at the end of the Great Tribulation and the beginning of a prolonged judgment, which was May 21, 2011, as Mr. Camping understood it, for five literal months, he thought all the elect would go up on that day in the rapture and the resurrection. Remember, the, the graves would open. That's why the earthquake and all the physically dead elect would, would rise and receive their new resurrected bodies. And because the Bible indicates that has to happen prior to those living on the earth being raptured, it has to happen almost simultaneously. So they all go up leaving the earth a mess and, and just catastrophic, full of death. And then the five literal months plays out without the elect present. And then came the last day of the five months and then the world's destroyed. So they are raptured according to that understanding on the last day because the last day is judgment day. The first day of judgment day is the last day or in that scenario the 153rd day of Judgment Day would be the last day. And so they're raptured and resurrected on the last day, even though there's time continuing. The correction that we have made, and of course circumstances, have forced us to see that the first understanding was wrong. Since the Bible locks in May 21, 2011 as Judgment Day, the beginning of Judgment Day, and we were not raptured, and there was no resurrection, it's obvious that the understanding, the elect are removed or taken out of the world so they don't go through Judgment Day is incorrect. It's wrong. But what we've learned is that we will go through the entire period. Then on the last day of the prolonged judgment, which is not five literal months, but five spiritual months that extends for many years, and the biblical evidence is pointing to the year 2033, that on the very last day of the entire period, then is the rapture, then is the resurrection, and the taking of all God's elect children out of the world, and, and then God destroys the world. So in other words, instead of at the beginning of the prolonged judgment, we understand these things to take place at the conclusion of the prolonged judgment. But either way, it is, since it's happening in judgment day, it's the last day. It's the last day. And, and so we've moved that last day to what actually amounts to the last day of a prolonged judgment to the other side. And the Bible has revealed to us in, in many verses that there's a demonstration we perform that we, according to 2 Corinthians 5.10, must appear before the judgment seat. The word appear is that word that taught us of Christ's demonstration, the Greek word. It's the very same Greek word. The word we in 2 Corinthians 5.10 is used repeatedly 
Um, I don't know how many times. Uh, I forget exactly, 10, 12, maybe 15 times. And in every instance, in the previous verses of 2 Corinthians 5, it's always the elect. And, and please read it. You'll, you'll see the plural pronoun we. You, you know, the, we walk by faith, it says there, and many other similar statements. The people of the world do not walk by faith. We, in that statement, can only refer to the elect. And when you carefully look at each use, you will find that only the elect are in view in verses 1 through 9 with the plural pronoun we. Then, when we get to verse 10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That is about as strong a case that the elect will be on the earth to go through the judgment as you can imagine. Additionally, since the word appear is that word it means to make manifest, that is used of the Lord Jesus, that we learned had to do with his demonstration, since God uses that word, he uses we must all appear. We must make manifest. And in order to make something manifest like that, you had to first experience the reality of it. That is, Jesus had to actually die for a sin at the foundation of the world before he entered into the world to make it manifest. We had to first have our sins paid for in Christ at the foundation of the world in order for us to appear or make manifest these things before the judgment seat. Since none of the elect, that is the unsaved people of the world, have had their sins paid for in Christ, they are not appearing before the judgment seat or making manifest anything. This is their first appearance. This is their actual judgment. And when you're experiencing the actual judgment, it is not a manifestation. For example, we don't read of Jesus that he was made manifest with the sins of his people at the foundation of the world. No, just that he's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. It's only when he enters into time, into history, that he makes it manifest. So for all these reasons, we can see that the Bible teaches that God's people not only go through the Great Tribulation, contrary to what many theologians thought and taught, but God's people also go through the final judgment of the world, contrary to, again, what many theologians thought and taught. But this is due to our uh, excellent vantage point. That's one thing we can say that's absolutely excellent about living on the earth at this point in time in history is it gives us a very clear vantage point of looking at the timeline and God's judgment program. And, uh, of course, you have to know that it is judgment. You have to, you have to know May 21, 2011 was Judgment Day. Then all kinds of things open up. Once you have that knowledge securely settled in your in your mind, in your soul, in your heart, that it was Judgment Day, then you begin asking yourself questions. Well, if it's Judgment Day, why is the world still here, and and uh, why is it so long, and and so forth, and why are, why are the elect still in the world, then you'd go to the Bible and you find answers. And if we were wrong about it being Judgment Day, then the questions that are arising would be nonsensical. They, they, there would be no answers. But, but the Bible is providing information to answer these things in a very definite way. And that helps us to know we're going the right way in understanding. But thank you for calling and sharing. And now we'll go to 
our next caller tonight. Welcome to our question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Yeah, uh, that was really a good explanation. It is really something that's amazing the revelation God has given us. Now, you were um, talking on a study about, or somebody, uh, I heard a sermon, was that, uh, you know, when when we're going through life, like in uh, Matthew uh, chapter 6, 33, seek ye the kingdom of God first and his righteousness, th that is really... Uh, nice and to really just really depend on him you were talking about in the study that uh, about that and that not to be covetous but I was going to ask you could you uh, say also um, some of the adjectives that we do have we don't we don't have big cars and money we're not going for that we're going for Christ and we have that hope of being saved and, and learning to really trust him and, and know him personally um, and being thankful for righteousness, salvation, uh, wisdom, strength. Those are the riches that, that we need and have to be given us, right? And those are the things we can constantly talk to him and thank him about, right? Do you understand my point that I'm trying to simply get at that all these things in the world that the lust and the, the murder or the power or or the riches or the fame or trying to be a big person and be proud and or be afraid and all those things. No, when you're resting and really trusting in Christ, you have no fear, you have power, you have love and a sound mind and all those other riches. And I, I just want to exemplify those those riches that I have and I can learn. I'm learning to rest and really thank him day to day, moment to moment. As it says in First Thessalonians 5, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and all things give thanks. Pray without ceasing. We, we talk to him about everything and learning to just take one day at a time. Now, I did a lot there, but I, I thought the positive parts uh, of seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, it's always seeking him. And uh, to look at the things he gives us and uh, that faith, you know, and stuff. Anyway, I went along on that. And I guess you can't add much to that, but uh, thanks for your program. It was really good. Praise God. Well, let me read the verse in Matthew 6, verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And this is summing up the previous verses that had the statement, take no thought. Uh, in them a few times, like back in verse 25, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on, is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment. Uh, or makes mention of which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature. And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. And then in verse 31, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take, therefore, no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. This is sort of God's um, mental health section right here, uh, because if we were to follow it and, and not take thought, for these things, we would have much more peace in our minds and in our lives. And it goes along with Philippians 4, 6, and 7, be anxious for nothing but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And, and then it goes on to say in the next verse, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, 
Well, true things are honest, just, pure, lovely, of good report, uh, praise, virtuous, and so forth. Think on these things. And that's basically what is being said here. Take no thought for these things of the world. Common, ordinary things. Food, drink, clothes, what's going to happen tomorrow. Um, it's what we spend our lives. It's what the people of the world spend their lives thinking about and worrying about and troubling themselves about. And it's often the cause of anxiety, of anxious feelings and of a troubled mind. And, and basically God is speaking to his people and he's saying that he is God and, and so your heavenly father knows you have need of all these things and, and so leave it with him and trust him with them and turn your attention, the focus of your mind where your thoughts are to more important things, to better things, which are the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is not observable. You can't see the kingdom. It comes not with observation. The kingdom of God is spiritual, and the Bible tells us about the kingdom of God. It tells us about the king of the kingdom and of the kingdom itself, its law, the Bible is the law of the heavenly kingdom. So we are to familiarize ourselves with the spiritual laws of the spiritual kingdom, of the spiritual God, and focus on that. Concentrate on that. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, and thy prospering will appear unto all. This is what God would have each of us to do, and uh, you know, it would be the best thing for each of us too if it did happen in our life, and God is moving us in that direction, especially at this time when he commands us to come out of her, Babylon, or, or this world, and uh, be not partakers of her sins and her plagues, if we're attached to things of the world, then we'll be a partaker. We'll be even more troubled because the world is crumbling. It is falling apart. It has fallen spiritually, but we're seeing the evidence of it. And so God is helping us to concentrate upon spiritual things, concentrate more upon the Word of God the Bible. But thank you for sharing your question and this verse. And now let's go to the next person on the phone tonight. Welcome to our question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Yes, uh, not that I was looking for a life verse, but uh, 2 Timothy 1.9 has become my life verse. And could you please read this Second Timothy one nine and Luke ten twenty. Second Timothy one verse nine says, "Who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, and not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began." And what's the other verse you want to look at? Luke chapter 10, verse 20. Compared to Luke 10, verse 20. Notwithstanding, in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. And what's your question about these verses? I heard Brother Camping explain that when the unsaved died, their names would then be blotted out. Thus, the names in both the Book of Life and the Lamb's Book of Life would eventually match. 
However, I have heard people pleading to the Lord to write or enter their names into the book of life. My question is, when were the names of the elect written in the book of life or the Lamb's book of life? Was it before or was it after the world began? Well, let, let's see if it's in Revelation 20. Um, where we read of these books, it says in Revelation 20, verse 12, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Now, from a creation standpoint, there was a book of life. Because when God made man, he made man good. And man would live forever as long as he obeyed God. And, and so... Um, in that sense, his name was in the book of life. But then when man fell into sin, he died, and his name was blotted out of the book of life. And, and so it was sin. You know, God didn't wait until the man physically died at the end of his life, but when a man sinned. And, of course, we, we all sin. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and and, and so we all had our names blotted out of the book of life. But um, uh, there was another book, the Lamb's Book of Life, which Revelation 13 makes reference to. In Revelation 13, verse 8, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. And it is that book of life where where God predestinated all um, that he intended to save, who he did save at this point. And that's the book of life uh, that that has been um, referred to and and um, in, in every generation when when one of those, a chosen individuals uh, was born and lived in the world. God obligated himself to bring his word to save that person by the application of the, the blood of Christ shed at the foundation of the world, and they did become saved. So um, th that's, that's a different book completely, and none of the unsaved people of the world are recorded in that book. It's exclusively God's elect. But thank you for calling and for your question. And now let's go to our next caller. Welcome to our Friday night question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Uh, hi, Chris. Um, can you please read uh, Luke 13, uh, starting in uh, verse 15? Um, this is where Jesus was telling, he killing the lady on the Sabbath day. And he calls her one, the daughter of Abraham. And he also says that Satan had bound her. Uh, so could you explain that? Oh, okay. Luke 13, right? Luke uh, 13 and verse 15. Okay. Here in Luke 13, verse 15, it says, The Lord that answered him and said, Thou hypocrite, doth not each one of you on the Sabbath, loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering. And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, lo, these eighteen years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day. And so, yeah, the, uh, Jesus had healed the woman, and it was the Sabbath the Seventh-day Sabbath, and the Jews were furious with him, and Christ used this healing as an occasion to teach them of the real meaning of the Sabbath, which always had to do with salvation. The Sabbath rest had to do 
with resting in Christ for salvation. And the woman who was bound by Satan for 18 years, and the number 18, if we were to break it down, is three times six. And six is the number of work, because God worked six days to create the world. And the number three, purpose, indicating that it's God's purpose to bring spiritual rest of salvation to this woman who was seeing all kinds of physicians and, and nothing better than as she had been trying to work to be healed, just as so many in the world try to work their way into heaven. And, and so Christ accomplished the work on her behalf, and he is the essence of the Sabbath rest, or the actual deep spiritual meaning of it, is to rest in him. And, and so he um, performed this healing to teach that, and also it teaches us the nature of the New Testament Sunday Sabbath, which would be for the people of God to be active in bringing the gospel, which would deliver sinners from bondage to sin and to Satan. And, and, and so Sunday for the New Testament was not a day of rest, um, a physical rest, but it was a day to go out, hand out tracts, go to places where there was sick and, and visit or, or things of that nature, just to bring the gospel in whatever way, by going to church and preaching, how, however it could be done, and this also touches on that. Can you tell us when the next day in the world is going to be and where it's going to be? Yeah. Uh, Lord willing, the next day in the word will be January 5th at the Merchantville um, Communities, uh, the Merchantville Community Center in Merchantville, New Jersey. But it, it does look like we'll have another location in January. Um, I, I think it's January 26th, but we'll confirm this with everyone on January 5th in Millville, New Jersey. And we're um, looking forward to meeting there. It's at a American Legion post um, that that has some benefits. And we'll, we'll talk about that, uh, Lord willing, when we get together on January 5th. But thank you for calling and sharing. Well, I would like to thank everyone for joining us tonight and sharing your questions and comments, and especially for bringing up the Bible verses that you did so that we had an opportunity to read them and consider them. But at this time, we're going to close our program. Well, everyone, have a good night, and may the Lord's perfect will be done. You've been listening to eBible Fellowship's Questions and Answers Time with your host and Bible teacher, Chris McCann. You can hear these question and answer sessions Sunday afternoons following the Sunday studies and certain weeknights. Check eBibleFellowship.org for the latest schedule. Until next time, may the Lord's perfect will be done.